get, re get elected. The second law of politics, as you all know, get reelected. Um, and so that's what happens. Um, and so politics takes over for good policy. We have had periods in which Tip O'Neill and President Reagan got along very well. And they worked out what was best for the country. Um, as opposed to uh, as what they thought was best for the country, as opposed to this kind of thing now, we're not talking, uh, we're not talking to them. So uh, those are my initial remarks. That's what I think is, is happening uh, in, this, uh, in this country. And that's why uh, I don't think we have uh, the kind of structure. Third parties, third parties don't work. So whoever's going to come up here and say we need a third party, forget about it, Jack. Um, you know, third parties just aren't, aren't tenable under this system for the reasons I've given. Thank you. That's my, that's my thank you. I will make a political announcement, um, equal opportunity. I wanted to call your attention that our next two speakers have arranged uh, for an opportunity for everyone to meet the candidates running for governor for the state of Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So this past Tuesday, the Republican uh, Party Association here in the Berkshires hosted Charlie Baker on the Outfront TV program, a nearly hour-long interview with um, Mr. Baker and a reception following, so people had a chance to come out and meet him. And this Sunday, the Berkshire Brigades is hosting a Meet the Candidates afternoon. Is it from 1 to 4? And where is it? at the ITAM Lodge in Pittsfield, and there are five candidates uh, going to be present, so again, you can come and meet the candidates who will be winnowed down in the primary. So we'll hear next from Jim Bronson. Thanks so much for coming tonight. Well, thank you. A little tick there. Good evening, Jim Bronson, Berkshire County Republican Association. I want to take a moment to certainly thank Lori and Tom for putting this together, and you folks are coming out to the Arctic Circle to some here hot air from the bunch of us. Quite nice of you to take the time to do it. Um, I found it interesting. Um, I've listened to NPR for a long time, and, and I'm a Republican who will admit that. And, and I, I, there's one thing I think that, that uh, the doctor obviously meant to say. He forgot. He was talking about the great bipartisanship of Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi and, uh, uh, oh yes, that's right, Harry Reid, when we talked about some of the Republican uh, obstructionists of, of the day. So something I thought would be interesting to do is to backdrop what conservatism is to a conservative, first of all. And certainly, I'm a conservative. In fact, I'm probably a, re a Republican second and a conservative first, and that's probably true for many of us. Now, um, uh, you know, uh, Alan teed me off just perfectly, and we had a nice chat outside, and we did not exchange notes or anything, so this is, uh, you know, I, didn't, I don't even have the cocktail napkin you did, so we'll, uh, that was smart of you to have that. So let's think about this, though, for a moment. What, what is a conservative? Well, a conservative is someone who believes in the people and the power of the people. We believe that each of us is our own destiny. You're created by God to do the right thing. Do the right thing. Help each other. Help your neighbor. That's a, it's a religious tenet. It's kind of a conservative tenet. We're often, uh, people will talk about conservatives as being zealots of some type. Uh, even, even today we, we've heard that. Well, a zealot? No. But, but are you someone who believes in personal liberty and personal responsibility? Well, absolutely. However, don't most of you who may not be conservatives believe in that too? You believe in raising your children in the right way? You believe, I'm certain, that if your neighbor's house was on fire or you came across a car accident, you are not going to say, oh my gosh, I wonder what their ideology is. Huh? No, you run out and you offer help. You're surely not concerned about that. A conservative isn't concerned about it, neither is a Democrat or, or anything else, neither, neither is a communist, for heaven's sakes. You help people. You're humans at the local level. It's when we get off into the abstract, oftentimes, I believe, is where these problems occur. When we keep it local, gosh, when the dog's barking or there's a massive pothole down at the end of my driveway, we call our selectmen or we call our town council, however it might work, and we're not too worried about ideology there uh, at all. We, we are worried about getting the problem fixed because we're working together. It's when it expands to this behemoth of national, nationalism and a huge government where all of a sudden it becomes us versus them. And sometimes that can happen in a state too. And you have to consider yourself, well, aren't you, and I'll go back, I'll, I'll bounce up and down here for a moment if I may. Most of us 
fiscally are conservatives, for heaven's sakes. We have to be. You can't outlive, outspend what you earn. Or if you do, you purchase a home or you purchase an automobile or pay for your kid's education, you have a reasonable plan to pay that back and you ex an expectation to pay it back. In our government of late, we have decided to run massive debts, which is what turns many of us conservatives into apparent zealots. The other thing I'm very happy to see, and I shan't steal any of his thunder, but the professor has a nice stack of constitutions. Many times it seems that us zealots on the conservative side would like to go back to the old days of the Constitution and to follow that a little bit more. And you wonder, how on earth did we get painted to be zealots who say, could we follow some constitutional law here? Could we go back to what made America great? Could we please go back to that? Of course we've learned a lot of lessons over time. Someone might say the Constitution talks about men or talks about half-citizens or things like that. Well, of course we've come a long way in, 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 in proper ways, for heaven's sakes. Of course there's, there's no, the mistakes of the past, such as slavery or women's suffrage. Of course we've corrected those things in our country. But of course the idea, the overwhelming foundation of the Constitution is what made us great and can continue to make us great. But we've come to a place where the media, local and national, calls that kind of thing craziness or zealotry Really? No, it isn't. I mean, I, gosh, I hope I'm not coming across that way to you. I hope I'm coming across like the guy you see in Pittsfield, because that's where I live. I'm your neighbor. You're our neighbor. The Tea Party was presented this way. The Tea Party was presented in, as a zealot, crazy, right-wing organization. Really? It isn't. Trust me. It isn't. The Tea Party is people like you and me. It's just your neighbors. It's people who said, we're spending more than we can afford to spend. And that created a huge rift. And all of a sudden we have a division. Yes, Glenn Beck was a guy who promoted those kind of things. And I, I, didn't listen to, I didn't listen to AMC or Glenn Beck today, so I didn't get anything, right? So, so I know nothing today. But, 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 but can, you, can you please understand, folks, where we as conservatives feel? We feel oftentimes that we've been boxed into a corner simply for feeling that we should spend within our means and follow the Constitution. So... That becomes, to other people, fighting words, and it's hard for us to understand why. As I mentioned before on the local perspective, many of you aren't ever feeling that way about your neighbor. You're, hey, it's a nice guy or a nice woman across the street. It's when it gets into the abstract that we come across with these, with these other problems. So how does all that come around to how we can talk to each other? Well, heck, we came to a beautiful museum to talk to each other. You look at the beautiful works Mr. Rockwell did, and even later in his life, I think he started saying, you know, I'm not really sure all this is exactly what it really looks like out there, but it certainly looks beautiful in what, in what he painted, and he started to realize later in his life that it, it maybe wasn't as, as perfect as his paintings were. So. Even then we had some problems, of course. Today we have problems. But are we willing to talk to each other? I will be, as a, as a representative of the Republican Party here in the Berkshires and as a conservative, tell you there's great ideas that Democrats have. I have no problem with talking with it. I also run a business. You have to talk with people who disagree with you. How do you get anything else done? It's silly for neither one of our parties to talk to each other. I've probably got a minute left, but I want to talk for just a minute about the, the sequestration. I would like to mention, I do not want us to get, I talked about in the abstract, so I'll try not to get too abstract. The sequestration, which was crazy. Okay, we decided that we would lower the increase in a budget, and only in government parlance, if you're supposed to get 4% and you get 2%, does that become a draconian cut? You're kidding me. Do you know how many workers and how many employees have worked for companies and organizations, and even sometimes in the government, for zero pay raise? Well, heck, that's a sequestration. Their money's going down well, with, the, with inflation. Well, baseline budget, my gosh, it sits there. So it's draconian to go from 4% or 2% or 3% to 1%. They had flat level funding or more, but we called it a problem. We shut the government down, allegedly, uh, a few months ago. I don't know if anybody noticed. If you, unless you needed a passport or a, a certain specialized service, I think 78% of the government was still up and running. So it was that 22% that may have gotten in the way. It isn't as though the government stopped. It isn't as though it stopped. My goodness, the 22%, which, uh, you know, allegedly, you know, how, how we calculate numbers cost zillions of dollars. I'm not sure I even buy it. But anyway, that 22%, 
And I know those are the numbers that they bantied around. It isn't as though you, you, you made them up or anything, Laurie. I've heard them too. Think about that, folks. Think about what that really meant to our, to our government. Not a whole lot, but we made it the biggest story on the planet, and it wasn't. So lastly, I just wanted to respond a little to the beginning of what we talked about. We should be able to talk to one another. We're all sitting here tonight to talk to one another. There's no reason our governments and our representatives don't talk to one another. We need to to get things done. But it was important for me to at least set the backdrop of what a conservative is to us who are conservatives and to hope that you'll understand that we're not these crazy right-wing wackos who want to, um, I don't know, let people die in the street or things that you hear on occasion. You've all heard that. You've seen it in the media. And that is simply untrue. We are, just like everybody else, trying to live in a constitutional land. I hope I didn't go too far with some of what conservatism is versus answering the, the questions, but we look forward to taking them after. I think I did about four minutes, so thank you very much. Okay, that's okay, I'm not that tall, is that okay? Um, thank you, Laurie, for inviting me and everybody for coming in. It's um, really quite a night to be coming out. And I have to say, you know, I was, uh, when Tom, and Tom, I have to thank you too, invited me to come as a thought leader. I was like, thought leader? You know, opinion maybe? But I'm not, not quite sure about thoughts. Um, but I, I'll do my best tonight. And I didn't really come prepared to talk about the, the democratic platform or what today is known as the progressive platform. Um, I grew up in a liberal household. And then as I got older, I was able to choose which direction I wanted to go in. And that took me through on a journey as to what was really going on in our, in our world. And so it wasn't until about three years ago that I became more active. I had really considered myself an armchair activist. You know, we have a weekend uh, armchair football players or uh, workers. Well, I would always sit in that armchair and I would rant and rave at the TV about what was going on. And then about three years ago, something occurred in my life that really woke me up and got me up out of the chair. And before you knew it, I was on this train um, heading down the, this political track that I never ever expected. So when I came to tonight was the thoughts about the common ground and you know we've become so polarized I had to really stop and think common ground. So what, I, what did I do? I googled it. It was like okay what do we mean by common ground? And it came up with some, some interesting, interesting uh, statements and one of them was really coming to an agreement or understanding of a situation. And I think what's been happening in our country is we've lost sight of the situation and what is really going on in this country. Rather than it's become more of them versus us, us versus them, what they want, we want, what they don't want, what we don't want. But what is the situation that we're really facing in this country and what is the common ground and how we can solve some of these problems? And the problems, of course, we know right now are jobs, our economy, um, equal rights, justice. Uh, and I think a lot of these things came to me this week with Martin Luther King on Monday and some of the things that he had said and over and over again that the values that we have in this country are justice, equality, respect and compassion. Now aren't those the, the key areas that we should be able to find common ground and I think Jim said that. You know, where are we in compassion for our fellow man? rather than what are you doing wrong or you don't deserve this or this one's right, that one's wrong. Where's the compassion for the people who are without jobs? And what can we do about that? Bringing the discussion back to the values. And poverty, truly, for America, supposedly the richest country in the world, to have the highest rate of children in poverty it's an embarrassment. I mean, I'm ashamed that I see that on the BBC News when they say that about America. And you go, wait a minute. So I'm sure the other some Republican side, they don't want to see poor children either starve. So where can we find the common ground there and how can we work on that situation? So for me, the whole idea of, of common ground is looking for all of those values that we hold and how do we share those? How can we work together on them?
Uh, one of the things when we talk about our Constitution, and it's our Bill of Rights, and I think uh, Jim will correct me, I think it was kind of really the first 14 amendments that really gave us those Bill of Rights, the rights to liberty, um, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those are other common grounds that we can share. And it seems to be our interpretation or our perspective on those areas that cause the problems that we have. And it's more our, not only our perspective, but our interpretation. How do we interpret that? Each of us have our own interpretation of what our, my, my idea of happiness certainly isn't coming out on a cold night like tonight. Um, but it could be, you know, actually it would be nice. If, as it is happiness because it's not snowing. Thank you. Um, and these are the areas where we need to start the discussion on, on where, what are our values and where can we work on those. Taking away the, my idea is right, your idea is wrong, what I do is right, what you do is wrong. Where can we share that and, and come to that? agreement to work on a situation and take away the power plays, the, um, the absolutes, and the judgments that are, are so prevalent. And I think that's where you see the, uh, the media it does have a lot of that. I mean, we, we now have two different types of, of news stations, the right side and the left side or the right side and the wrong side, or the wrong side and the right side. So, you know, we have that polarization right there that we've never had before. I don't remember any of that growing up. Um, you know, you had a few com com commentators um, who would maybe interject a little bit of an influence in, in what they were talking about, but in general they didn't. So how can we work with that? I think there's a common ground there that we can look at in helping to you know, change the perspective or perhaps the way the media is operating. Um, and the, when we talk about wanting to be treated equally, don't we all? You know, why would we have people not being treated like me or like you or like everybody else? Why is there an issue in inequality, um, whether it be financial or religious or the color of our skin or our beliefs or whatever? Um, I think we can look at equality and, and, and work towards that. And then the respect. Don't we all want to be respected? Um, you know, someone said to me a long time ago, you have to earn your respect. Well, that to me is like beauty. It's in the eye of the beholder. Um, who is going to judge or who's going to determine what I do and what I, what I don't do that prevents me from getting respect? I think we all want that, and everybody deserves that. And that's part of our, our um, American way. And then the areas that we have, these are the areas that we have. And perhaps I think what I did come across today, and I had heard it before, but was a quote that Hillary Clinton had given about common ground. It was the last thing I found on Google. And what she said was, what we have to do is to find a way to celebrate our diversity and debate our differences without fracturing our communities. And I think that's what we're doing in Common Ground. Uh, our last thought leader, and we call you thought leaders rather than asking people to come up here and be experts because we're all experts in this room and we're actually all thought leaders. So that's why we invite you as thought leaders. But Professor Jim Arpanti teaches government at Berkshire Community College and constitutional law. And I'm sure we'll learn a thing or two tonight about uh, how our country was founded. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Laurie and Tom, and really glad to see all you people here. It's a much bigger crowd than I thought would show up on a night like tonight. So I'm happy for that, and I'm glad I only got five minutes, because that's the usual attention span of my classes, to be honest with you. Uh, I, think I, can, I think I can work with a limited time. Um, I didn't prepare any remarks, much like uh, Alan says, you get used to kind of speaking on your feet and rolling with the flow and so forth, but I did give it a lot of thought about what our topic is tonight, this division or polarization of regions in America and between the political parties. And when I really start thinking about it pretty deeply over the last week or so, 
See, I consider this a lot. I talk about it in my classes. This country's been polarized since day one. Let's think about that, okay? In fact, societies have been polarized since biblical times. If we get back into history that far, maybe not in the same way we're polarized in, in the United States, but there's been a polarization. And we notice if we look back at history, that a lot of the things that we're arguing about and discussing now have been a continuing topic. Poverty, for instance, at a minimum wage. I mean, think of why the United States or the states broke, or the colonies at the time broke away from England. Government wasn't responding to their petitions or their, uh, their grievances. We hear a lot of talk about that today. Government's not responding to our grievances or our comments or our thoughts. You know, Congress has an all-time low status in the minds of the general public, as does the president. His, you know, rating is going down a bit. Well, that's nothing new. Nothing new at all. Sometime in the reflection of history, we seem to think that, well, things were better back then. Well, if you think about the minimum wage and poverty, think about it in terms of even the Great Depression or the minimum wage. Every state can pass its own minimum wage laws, like Massachusetts can have, or New York or whatever other state can have a higher minimum wage than the federal government sets as a standard, because really we're a nation of states. We're not the People's Republic of America, we're the United States. And the states still hold a great deal of power and authority in the governance of their internal affairs, the health, education, and welfare of the general populations, no matter how much the national government wants to interfere with that. And there seems to be a general feeling that, well, maybe the government can do a better job than the states can. The national government can do a better job than the states can. There's also a growing feeling that I perceive, having been out at Ber Berkshire Community College, really a grassroots uh, organization, if you will, educational organization, that the general public seems to want government to do more and more for them. You know, act in the place of parents, in local parentis, it's called. Well, say, how do you think about that? Well, when I was a boy, I didn't go to kindergarten. My mother chose to have me stay home as long as possible so she could socialize me and bring me up and give me values, the family values, even though they might have been different than the family next door or down the street. Nowadays, we've got not only kindergarten, we've got pre-kindergarten. And we've got Head Start and pre-Head Start. Uh, I had a professor years ago out at American International College whose theory was that someday the national government is going to take a child from the mother as soon as the child can live on its own, so to speak, you know, six months or a year, and the government's going to bring it up and give it back to the parents sometime in the future when the kid's a teenager or maybe, you know, in junior high or middle school or high school or something like that. We thought he was absolutely nuts. This is back in the mid-70s. Well, if we look at the situation now, maybe he wasn't so nuts, nuts in his theories. Because what we see more and more is parents giving up the socialization of their children to governmental run or governmental bodies at a very early age. Does that surprise any of us? Well, maybe to a certain extent when we talk about it like I'm talking about it, but that's what's going on. So we're not dealing with topics that are new, it's just we're expecting more and more of government, and should we? That's, that's a basic question, should we? It's like the war on poverty, Lyndon Johnson, back in the middle of the 1960s. What are we talking about right now in the news? Current headlines, a war on poverty. Well, it's 50 years ago, okay? We lost a war on poverty. I'm sure you all heard that statement. It's true. More and more people are living below the poverty level. More and pe more people have poor paying jobs or low paying jobs, and we expect government to do something about it. Well, if government provides the job, somebody has to pay for it, and that's us. Well, most of us don't like paying higher taxes. So we start polarizing with things. Well, government should do more, government should do less. On the left, philosophy says, well, government should do more for the people. And rightfully, government should do some more things for the people. On the right, people should take care of themselves. Okay? Well, that makes some sense, too. And it addresses two of the comments made by the two previous speakers here, including Dr. Shartak. What do we expect from government? What do we try to do with government? Well, I see the problem as not only a polarization of the political parties, things aren't changing in Washington, because you got to remember, both political parties, the Democrats and the Republicans, run the show. They pass the election laws. They pass the campaign finance laws. There's no term limits. Why? Well, because the Constitution doesn't allow for term limits. 
on the national level, and about 90% of members of Congress get reelected if they run for reelection. That's astounding. So once you're in, away you go. You spend most of your time running for reelection rather than addressing the needs of the people, the true needs of the people. You address your own needs first. I guess we're all selfish in that way, but you know, the name of the game is getting elected and getting reelected, and away we go. And there is that polarization amongst the parties. I remember when Silvio Conti was our uh, member of Congress in the first Berkshire district out of Pittsfield, every summer up on an Oda Lake, he had a cottage on a lake, a modest cottage, he'd have a big picnic. And all kinds of people would show up, not hundreds, but you know, he'd get, he'd get a smattering of his friends from Congress, both Democrats and Republicans, they'd have a hell of a time. They'd drink beer and go fishing and listen to the radio and have a good time. Everybody got along great. And if you look at the history of the relations between the political parties, even back then, in the 1960s, even through the 70s, uh, it was mentioned that, like, Tip O'Neill got along great with Ronald Reagan and so forth. They left their differences at the door. They went out and ate together and drank together and had fun together and so forth. And there's still some of that in government. The most conservative justice on the Supreme Court, Antonin Scalia, his best buddy on the court is Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the most liberal member of the court. They differ in their philosophy and opinions and so forth, but they like each other. I don't know if you want to say love each other, but in their own way, they love each other. They, they're affectionate toward each other. And that's amazing. We just got to look at things like that. And put these differences aside. Put the differences aside and rely, I think, more on state governments for our local needs than the national government. That's easier said than done, I guess, but each state does control its own health, education, and welfare of its inhabitants. Now, I'm going to give everybody a copy of the Constitution. That's not a great gift on my part. They've been provided to me by Congressman Richie Neal. I hand them out to my classes at Berkshire Community College. And I've got some extra copies. It's not a political campaign tool for him, but I guess it is in a way. But that's not why I'm doing it. I just figure if you take the Constitution and look at it, read it. It's probably about 20 pages in that little book I'm going to give you. you you'll be surprised at what's in there. It's not hard to read. Some of the language is a bit archaic, but it's not really hard to read. And then when you hear this stuff on the radio, about political parties and elections and so on and so forth, it'll be a little clearer to you. Because truthfully, this stuff is not being taught in public and I think most private schools any longer, especially here in Massachusetts. In my basic course in government, you know, U.S. government, you'd be surprised that the students, I asked my, my class, I'm teaching the Constitution and Civil Rights this semester, I asked how many people in here, I got 20, six students, I think it is, in class. How many people in here have taken a course in government, either in junior, high, or middle school, or high school? Six raised their hand. Six out of 20, 26 people. Now, this has been happening over years. I think to myself, why? Why isn't government forced upon the student? Why don't you make the students learn about the basis of who controls them or tries to control them? And I'm at a loss as to why. The only reason I can think, and it sounds crazy, and maybe I am a little crazy after all these years. I mean, why would I teach at that one college for 40 years? So I have to be a little soft. You know, I probably should have went somewhere and made more money. But nonetheless, I like that community college system. In my opinion is government doesn't require courses in government at the college level or even in most secondary schools, if you will, because they don't want you to know. What else is the reason? Of all the other nonsense that gets forced into students' heads or they're exposed to, why not take our time as a society and indoctrinate our young as to how, how government works and maybe what, they, what the students should expect from it? And maybe that's what we can do tonight. Come together with an idea of how we can get, better, get along better, not only as individuals, but on the state level. Remember, we're a nation of states. That's why Massachusetts is different from Texas, different than Oklahoma or California, different than New York State. I mean, what, we're only a couple of miles from New York State here. It's a world of difference. New York has its own laws re regarding the health, education, and welfare, the police powers of New York citizenry. Massachusetts has different laws. Not that one's bad or one's good, but they're different. And because they're different, people see that as something's wrong. We all don't think the same. We don't act the same. Different things are expected of us. That's not right. We should be a homogeneous group of individuals. That wasn't the intent of the founding fathers of the Constitution of our country, and it shouldn't be the intent of any of us now. We have to remain individuals. We have to have alternatives 
If we don't like it here in Massachusetts, we can leave. Not because we're thrown out, but we can leave. Thank you. Will Singleton, Pittsfield. As the professor was talking about the lack of uh, subject matter concerning the government in our public schools, uh, and I know he was sincere about the importance of teaching that, but I couldn't help but think of, I don't know how many of you saw the movie Back to School with Rodney Dangerfield. Yes? Yeah. And the, uh, I think it was the economics professor who was going to talk about the development of a corporation to build widgets. And he started talking about how to do that, and Rodney Dangerfield was going nuts. Because he said, but wait a minute, you're not talking about we got to grease the palm of this person and yada, yada, yada. So when you talk about teaching civics or how the government works, if we're going to be honest, one of the biggest problems, in my opinion, is the money thing. And I guess, how do you teach the truth about the way our society is working today? And at the same time, because it's very negative, in my opinion, but at the same time, give our young people the hope that they can change it. In other words, some people think that if you tell people the truth, that you're very negative and you're not trying to move forward. And my problem is, as Dick Gregory once said, if your eyesight is great, your hearing is great, your heart's working the way it should, and the doctor tells you that when you go to see him or her, but you've got a tumor on your brain, and the doctor doesn't talk about that, well, where the hell are you? All right, who would like to address that question? Anyone from the audience or professor? I'll just make a quick Great. response. Thank you. Well, I do bring this stuff up in my classes, all right? Uh, a few years back, about 10 years or so ago, I was on the Pittsburgh City Council. No big deal, but I used to tell my classes, get involved in government. And it finally dawned on me, I better put my money where my mouth is run for election and see how it is, and you know, you lose a couple times, but you, your eyes get wide open after a while. And I mentioned things like the role of gov uh, money in government. It's needed, people have to understand that. But the hard part is to impress upon the students is what that really means, as you're saying. Because the students nowadays, and again, I sound like an old timer, and I guess I am getting to be an old fuddy-duddy, is that students really aren't interested in the news any longer. They really don't pay attention to current events. You know, I, I listen to the radio on my way out to teach college at, at 8 o'clock in the morning, and many times, even most times, there's something on the radio that we can talk about in class. I'm talking to a bunch of blank faces. There's not that concern, there's not that zeal to be critical any longer because they've been indoctrinated somehow, I really believe this, into what you just said. If you make a comment about something, you want to change something, you're being negative. And that happened to me on the city council. I used to bring up stuff, oh, you're negative, you're negative. Well, if you're trying to right a wrong, you're not being negative, you're being positive. But as soon as you start getting critical about something, all of a sudden, it seems, it seems to a lot of people, like there's something wrong with you. Don't listen to him, you know, he's negative about stuff. Don't listen to him or her because, you know, government's full of bribery and, you know, you see in the newspapers all the time, even over in neighboring New York State, a half a dozen or a dozen guys, Mr. Shartok would know better than I do, that, uh, you know, were indicted or got removed from the New York Assembly, which is like our House of Representatives, because of uh, unethical behavior and so forth. Well, most people don't pay attention to that. It almost becomes second nature that government's going to operate that way. And unless you know the basics of government and how it should work, you really don't know that government can be different than it is. I'm Betsy Salkowitz from Pittsfield. And I understand the fiscal disparity between the two sides. And I listen to the statement that on the, on the right that people should have more freedom to take care of themselves and do what they want. But then I wonder why, when it comes to women, and to gays and lesbians, they feel they must be regulated, mostly with religious implications or non-scientific um, information as a base. Maybe, uh, maybe Alan will take this after me, but um, I'll certainly give it to him. Gosh, that's not part of the secret code book they give us. 
Um, th there is no, did it? Well, I'm, I'm not sure what, what they said on the radio, but, you know, oftentimes we're conservatives or very religious. I might count myself that way, and I think we're all God's children. So what somebody does when they're at home or their gender, I've got two, two young ladies who I call my daughters. You know, I've got two girls at home. So their future is the most important thing on earth to me. Same with their mother. I'll take the three, care of the three ladies in my house. That's why, you know, I work a million hours at my job and volunteer and do other things. And I think many people, you're probably that way. Most people are really that way. Again, we go back to the thing I said at the beginning about the abstract. Well, they said that they have to be goodness. There's a few of my friends here. Several of them are ladies, as you'll see over there. They're as active in, in our organization as anything else. We, we don't think of... I don't know anyone who thinks, oh my gosh, well, there's a woman. It was a good point until I realized that there was a woman. Or he was spot on. Oh, that's right, he's a gay guy. No, never mind. That is not how it works. It just isn't. It's part of the thing. And, of course, I'm certain there are people in our party and in our conservatives just as well as in any other who do believe that way. And that's short-sighted and foolish. But we don't believe that. My goodness, it would make no sense. What we do believe, as I said at the beginning, is the power of the person, the power of the people. And it doesn't mean, we talked last night, we very much believe in giving, we talk about this in church and we talk about it when we're doing political things. You believe in giving someone, what, the old saying, a hand up, but not always a hand out, because it does not further that person. It may get them their supper tonight. Let's go, let's go way back to the beginning. Teach a man to fish or feed the man the fish. I believe, we believe it's more important to, you know, teach the man to fish than give the man the fish. Of course, we'll give it to you tonight because you're hungry, but the point is, if we don't help you over time, help you help yourself, then forever you'll just be waiting for us to give you the fish. That wasn't three minutes yet, but I saw you out the back of my eye. I saw that. All right. So I just wanted to say two things. Number one, there are such things in this world as facts. And there is a fact. We know that, and I say this to the professor also, that when a kid uh, gets pre-K, the avoidance of jail at the other end of life is much greater. So the idea of, um, of understanding what the facts are is very important. But I also wanted to say something self-serving about WAMC. But it's so surprising yeah. to do that. <laughs> Every Friday, I think it's Friday, we have a guy named Herb London on the air. And there is nobody who is further to the right than Herb London. Oh, you are. Okay. Well, good. And, and, uh, and um, I get all of these calls from my liberal colleagues um, who say, get him off. This is our station. We don't want him on the air. Well, this is the point of Laurie's bringing us all together. Uh, which is that we want to hear what somebody else has to say, even if it's offensive. Um, and I think, I think that that is our intolerance. There's a mention of it before. But so now we have Fox, the number one cable station in the country. We have, you knew that, didn't you? Fox is number one. M MSNBC is number two. The liberals go to MSNBC to hear what they want to hear. And the conservatives go to Fox to hear what they want to hear. But there's no mutual meeting ground. So you get CNN, which tries to do a job of covering it all, and they come in a miserable third. People don't go where they think that they have, their brains have to be exercised or worked on. And I think, that's, I think that's pretty important. OK, that's my three minutes, Lord. My name is Patrick Fennell. I live in Great Barrington. And my question to all of you is, uh, for, why is government so big? Because right now, government's stumbling on each other. For example, there's 126 agencies and departments to help the poor. And the last I saw, we have more people today than we had 20 years ago. Mike, Ina Wilhelm, uh, Richmond, Mass. I, I think the, the process was to talk about how we can talk to each other and how we can model. And I think what's happening is we're modeling not how to do it because everybody's going point by point. You know, you bring up the lesbian issue, somebody counteracts that. You bring up the uh, conservative issue, somebody counteracts that. You bring up 
the government is too big, so someone will come up and say, well, la di da 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 And so we're going point by point, which takes us to two different things, because, you know, the minute somebody uh, goes off on Head Start, that brings me right out, because I'm an educator, I know the value of Head Start, I've been part of it in graduate school, so that brings me to stand up and fight for Head Start, and that's not the point. So if somebody can bring us back to the value of what are the components of the conversation that will make us listen to each other. Where's the common ground, right? Yeah. Nicholas Peck, Stockbridge, and uh, um, I merely wanted to say that uh, how much I appreciated the comment of the BCC professor on the subject of civics in the schools. And uh, I just wanted to relay one story, which was that I met one of the uh, Mississippi Freedom, one of the Freedom Riders uh, who risked their lives to, to make sure the federal government desegregated interstate bus travel back in the late 50s. And uh, they showed a movie, a documentary about it in Great Barrington last year. And uh, I was talking with one of these Freedom Riders who'd been beaten up in Mississippi when he was on this integrated bus. And uh, what he said to me was, the only hope is that they bring back civics to the, to the schools. And it just the, the, and I, so anyway, I hope we leave here tonight thinking about how we can do that. There's another um, comment that was shared with me last week. I was visiting a patron of this museum. She lives in Nashville, where our collection's on exhibition right now at the Frist Art Center. And she's actually given a Norman Rockwell painting to the museum, an, a, a new, an original canvas post cover. And I was telling her about this evening, and she said, well, it's simple. People don't eat together, they don't stay in Washington, they don't have meals together, they don't socialize together. And you were addressing that earlier, um, that when Congressman Silvio Conti would have a party in the summer and everybody would come together, or people would socialize, they, or the Supreme Court justices would put their political differences aside and be neighbors and friends. And her comment that now with plane travel and our elected officials can fly home on the weekend and they're not socializing together, there isn't that opportunity to bond and come together around our human values. And I just thought that was such an interesting observation um, by an 86-year-old woman who has seen a lot and is a very generous patron of this museum. So, Alan. I spoke in the beginning about the reapportionment process. But it is no secret to me, I mean, we can idealize Silvio Conti all we want, and I love the man, but um, he was in a district which was, could go either Republican or Democratic at the time. And so therefore, it was in his interest to go towards those people to make this common ground, to say things to the Democrats that would make them vote for a Republican. But when now that we have this reapportionment process with such an incredible, uh, you know, consequence, uh, Texas, as I say, they well, how many five congressmen at one blow they were able to knock out just because of the way they drew the lines. So Conti was one smart guy, uh, but he was in a district that dictated the way that he talked and brought people together, as opposed to a guy who may be in one of those conservative Texas districts who's got to go face a primary with somebody, and I'm going to give him the microphone next, because somebody who might be a little bit more wacko than he, um, um, and, 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 um, and therefore out-conservative him and conservatize him. And that's the difference between what Conti did and what some guy in Texas might do. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Catherine Mickle from uh, Dalton, Mass. Um, I'd like to, to put out there exactly what you were saying is, how do we find common ground? I think that the four freedoms is common ground. And yes, Norman Rockwell probably idolized what our freedoms should be. And I think that's what we need to do. The Constitution is this little tiny book that we've got here that all of us have a foundation for, all of us. Now we get bills that have this many pages that are not comprehensible. 
Where do we find common ground? In the Constitution. In our basic, go back to basics, talk to each other, respect each other. And I think the most important thing that we can do is to teach that to our children. How many times, I, I couldn't graduate from high school without doing a Maplewood. Yes, I graduated from Pittsfield High. And we had to learn civics. Those are the two things we had to do, gym and civics. <laughs> And I think that's really important, that we do need to give our children, which are our future, the basis for what this country was built on. Build it on the Constitution. There's so much out there right now that, that polarizes us, and I really honestly believe it's on purpose. Let's divide. Let's conquer. Let's ruin our country because we're not together. I think this is an extraordinary evening, and I so applaud the Norman Rockwell to be able to do this. But I really think that we need to look at what Norman wrote in, in his paintings. I look across and I look at some of these things. I think that these are awesome for freedoms. If we can constantly keep our eyes on the prize, on the, the freedom that this country was built on, and what our founding fathers argued for. And they did argue. They argued and argued and argued until finally Ben Franklin said, you're all going home, we're going to pray about it, and you're going to come back. And when they came back to the Constitution, that convention, they were all in agreement. We need to argue. We need to be strong in what we believe in. But we need to base it on what we, what we want for our future. I think all of us can agree that that is what we're here for, is to build up our wonderful country and to keep its principles. I'm Mike Fish. I'm here from Great Barrington. I just wanted to say that uh, things can change. I mean, obviously, we have a lot of negative things. And in particular, we have a tradition which runs right back to the founding fathers and even before of winner takes all and if you win, you don't stop there. You want to crush the opposition and take the rest of the game, too. Uh, but I was very struck uh, this past week that in Germany, which after World War I had a history of fighting in the street and killing their opponents, uh, this past election they formed a large coalition which was just inaugurated, and they have 85 per seats, 85 percent of the seats in the parliament. So the head of the parliament came on and said, look, we've got to give more power to the opposition because they're only 15 percent, and we have to be able to have a, a proper civic dialogue. Now, the only thing is, I think that's very positive and it's very hopeful. Of course, we don't want to have to go through what they went through to come to that conclusion, but uh, it shows it can be done. Hi, I'm Bill Hosley from Enfield, Connecticut, and, uh, you know, I look at this the picture across the way here of the freedom of speech, I always get goosebumps looking at that and thinking about that. I was, when I was first out of college, I lived in a small Vermont town and it was, um, you know, I went to these town meetings. I had never really experienced firsthand what that was about and they were argumentative and they were, con you know, sort of, there was controversy, there was debate and it absolutely fascinated me. I thought it was the best course I didn't take in college, just showing up. And I, I loved your point about argument. I think argument is, the, is sort of the, the quality of, of civic life that keeps uh, 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 us from snapping into a kind of uh, homogenous mindset where a debate is uh, removed and where choices are removed. And it's really our, it's not just our right, it's actually our, our duty is to argue. And, um, you know, I look around these pictures and you, you kind of think about a world we have lost and it seems like Norman Rockwell captured, you know, quality of civic life and a quality of social life in America that you kind of wonder if he were here today what, what he would think of where we've ended, where we've landed. And I just, you know, I think there's, I joke about it, if an enemy combatant wanted to destroy this country from, uh, uh, they couldn't do a more effective job 
than we've done to ourselves by stripping history and civics out of the curriculum. Why we don't teach these things. No child left behind uh, was bad enough, and if you can't measure it and test it, it doesn't, it's not real, it's crazy. And now we've got this whole common core thing, which I think it, to me is even scarier, and it's a kind of homogenizing of thought that, you know, I'm sure there's some pros, but there's some cons. We should be arguing about those things, it seems to me. Thank you, William. You might all be pleased to know that the school curriculum that the Norman Rockwell Museum teaches in all of the regional schools teaches civics and the four freedoms and the basic foundation of our constitution and our uh, curator of education, Tom Daly, heads that program. So that is happening here at Norman Rockwell Museum. Bill Mickle, uh, live in Dalton, and looking at these pictures kind of brought, um, I'm a, a veteran, I have four uncles that were World War II veterans, uh, my son is a veteran, I'm also a retired police officer, and a retired businessman, sounds like an awful lot, I don't look 98, <laughs> uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, I, be, I guess I'm, I have to say this quick three times, a, a right-wing wacko. I must be because I believe in God, country, our constitution, personal responsibility, limited government. And I guess in today's society that makes me a wacko. And I guess I have to stand up and still say that's what I am. Because uh, I took an oath twice to defend this country, as this man right here did. Twice he's a retired trooper. Uh, so... There are people in this room that have put their life on the line for this country and for what it believes in. If it sounds a little corny, it's the way it is. Uh, well, you hit it right on the head, the truth. Some people are afraid of it. And sometimes it doesn't sound too good, it isn't too good, but it's the truth and it has no agenda. Thank you. I, I have a myriad of things I would like to address, but I don't think this is the proper point. But I'd, I'd like to state in, in regards to that young lady and that gentleman beside her that I think the key to this country's societal problems lie in education. And if we don't educate people, and I'm talking not just channel young people's minds, open them, please, to educators, open our young people's minds. Let them think for themselves. Every tyrant in the history of civilization has sought to eliminate the educated and the thinking person. Pol Pot, you, you can list a myriad of people who have done that to their own people because they feared the intelligent, free-thinking young people in that society. And if we don't do a good job, and, and I admire so many people who dedicate themselves to education, but I despise those educators who seek to close minds and not open them. And I'll, I'll save uh, the rest of my problems for perhaps another meeting with you great people that are here tonight. Could you and say your name and where my from? name is A. Lincoln, <laughs> and the A stands for another. <laughs> I'm from Lee. Thank you very much, and thank, to, thank you to everybody here. Hi, I'm Joe Bosworth in Dalton. Um, first of all, I wanted to uh, thank you for your, this last gentleman, for your comments, um, which I wholeheartedly support. And the only other thing I did want to say is that among the last six um, comments, com you know, people who commented, there were, there were two thoughts, but I didn't see them placed solidly together, so I'm just going to do that myself. And, you know, one of them, uh, expressed a number of ways was that we should be prepared to argue. Uh, you know, that's, there's nothing wrong with arguing. We should all be prepared to argue. But the other point that was mentioned uh, was that we should also agree when we argue to come back together when we're done and move forward uh, so that the argument leads to some accomplishment on our parts. So yes, we should argue but we should agree to come together at the end of that argument with something that moves us forward. Lila Burley from Stockbridge, and I have 14 grandchildren. 
Uh, I'm lucky. <laughs> I have to say, my late husband used to say the, the biggest problem in this country is we do not respect people who go into politics. And, I have, and, and the people that I have known who are really great human beings in the political arena are very powerful. And they tend to be the people who are reaching out to young people. Uh, I have a granddaughter who is uh, going to major in government right now. And she's very concerned about big issues, policy. Uh, she is really engaged. And she's had people reach out to her. Our wonderful governor, she was on the first um, students, uh, uh, what do you call it? youth, the, the youth people. And it was a collection of, of two kids from each county in, in the state. And it was powerful. It was a bunch of kids just picked by their schools or whatever who went to these meetings. And they met once a month, and usually for two years. It had a profound impact on her. Uh, the fact, I'm so proud that she's going to major in government, but I see the media, and it's not only um, the media, Alan, I'm not going to say that, but we are taking pot shots at our politicians. We hardly give them room to wiggle. And, and I think that there are a lot of very wonderful people in the political arena, in Washington, in Massachusetts, in our towns. God bless people who run for things. I mean, you know, Andy and, and uh, Buddy here were on the school committee with me at one point. And you know, we didn't see much the same, did we, Buddy? But, but it was okay. We had a great dialogue. And we respected each other. And I think that the lack of respect, because of all these electronic, I'm an old-fashioned person, I guess, but the electronic things are not letting us talk to each other the way we used to. And everybody kind of disappears in them. When my kid, grandchildren come to my house, no electronics. And they can wait and do their emails after. And I want to talk to them. You know, I, it, it is a very powerful thing when people talk to each other. And Norman, God bless him. I mean, you know, look at this. This is my favorite picture in the whole museum. And that lady knows where she's going. <laughs> How many people in our world know where they're going? And that is the education thing that we've been talking about is very real. But I, that's a great picture. And if we all had that kind of, you know, we'd be somewhere. Terrific. And I do have to point out we are so happy to have the Gossip's painting back on loan after it sold at auction last fall. And if people aren't talking there together, I don't know what would illuminate that. So let's keep talking. Hi, I'm Sue Fish, sort of from Great Barrington, partly from elsewhere. I think it's all well and good to say we learned history. Well, I learned that the good white men killed those bad Indians. Not that those people came in and took the land away from those Indians. I also learned there was discrimination in the South, and it didn't exist up North. I mean, we were fed such a crock of so many things. And I agree people should know history. But I think, I think it's getting better what I hear from my grandchildren. They're not being fed the same lies. And if you're talking about truth, you got to revise that entire curriculum that we were fed. And I don't honestly know exactly where it's up to. But just to say, you know, we, we did all this, we learned all this. I'm not sure it was such a great thing, and it took me a long time to grow up and say, wait a minute, I don't think this was right. I don't think that's really what happened. I mean, you think about the veil of tears and things like that. That was our government who did that. Well, <laughs> do with that what you want. And I will restrain myself and not say anything else difficult as it is. Thank you. Uh, I'm Ron Barron from Richmond. And... Uh, Anything I want to say is kind of in conjunction with most of what I've heard, one of the roots of which is money that you bring up. Uh, first of all, uh, I speak about media and Alan's comments. Uh, I do think that contemporary media and the t uh, is driven by money and the 24-hour news cycle and the need to make money, and they sensationalize everything. A great example is the fact that we have the Weather Channel. We've had weather since the beginning of time. And now weather is all of a sudden more important than it ever was, regardless of the global warming discussions and wherever it came from. 
So that's an example which I think drives people apart and, 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 re and highlights people's already formed beliefs, as you suggested, the obvious news networks that do that. And I think all news does that because they have to sell it. And, and uh, so, so that's one, one of the things that I think takes people apart. And the issue then with, with uh, being all financially driven, I, I think it's been crucial throughout the history of the country. Most of the decisions were, were made based on much of the things we've heard about were, had financial roots to them, I think. And so uh, I agree, the professor, I'm happy to hear him start by saying that this isn't different than it's always been, that there's been differences, and this is good. I am puzzled by the, the uh, ferocity of the, of the discussions that take place, and I hope this can be a little more balanced and we all can agree on common beliefs that have been pointed out that we should all, all feel. But uh, I come to the belief that, that I, any elected office should not be compensated. And I say that uh, rather radically because uh, people are already governed by money as it is. Those who get elected are elected by the supporters that raise money for them. I mean, the whole idea that you have to be reelected every two years also highlights the inability of those who are elected to get anything done because all they worry about is getting reelected and redistricting and so forth, as you've already discussed. So if there was no money involved in it other than what they couldn't use their own money to be elected and, they could, and there was no public money in the monies that their supporters were to raise on their behalf, which is kind of what happens now anyway. So, and most of the people, we complain bitterly that only people who get elected are the wealthy, probably because they have the time and the money to get into politics. And I think there are many, a lot of people who go into politics, uh, quite honestly. I'm a little disturbed that the original concept was that the politicians would serve the people and only serve a limited time and then return to their former uh, line of work and not become career politicians, which people now go to study to be politicians. They're po politicians their entire life. And so they worry about getting elected. And that's what they, so that's what they've always done. And they may be well-intended. They may think they're doing for altruistic reasons. At least we hear them say that when they speak. But, but they are controlled by money. They've always been controlled by money. Lobby controls them now. So I don't think how, I'm not sure how, if the capitalist society were ever going to take money out of the equation and, and discuss the individual need to be successful and make money. But uh, it, it's, it is the kind of thing that I think drives us apart and makes common ground hard to find. So to, um, uh, I think a lot of the fundamental issues that we've heard presented by Democrats and Republicans have their roots in, in, in money and, and, and the need to, to have that part of our society. On February 3rd, uh, the f next fun drive begins. I hope you're all there. That's Norman Rockwell's birthday, Alan. But we're not going to talk about anything else until you call 1-800. What's the rest of it? 323-9262. Operator is just standing by now. We're waiting. Hey, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out tonight. And it is wonderful. And I think, look, look what happened tonight. Everyone did talk. I think all of us, especially the conservative guy, was thinking, oh, my gosh, are they going to throw rocks and garbage this way? Uh, no, we didn't. What, what did we do? We talked. And you should all be applauded for talking. Whether or not we answered all your questions the right way or the way you think or completely opposite of the way you think, we certainly all talked tonight. So God bless all of you for coming and doing that. And thank you again, Laurie, and, and the museum and everyone. So good night. That's great. And I'll agree. So you look at that. Okay. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> Say it louder. Thank you. And again, I'd like to thank everyone for coming and for the various comments that people made. Terrific. Terrific. We got to thinking. No matter what we think, we got to thinking. And that's the whole idea of the game. As Mr. Singleton pointed out, we don't need money to think. Right? And sometimes it's pretty difficult. Really, you think about it. I know my students have a hard time thinking. They really do. I gave them a, a workbook one time on critical thinking. I discontinued using it. They, they didn't read it. They didn't want to do it. But here we did it. Thank you very much. Well, I want to echo our thanks, uh, all of us at the Norman Rockwell Museum, to uh, thank you for coming out, to especially thank our thought leaders who gave an evening to come and help lead this conversation and spark dialogue. Uh, that's the spirit behind the Four Freedoms Forums, and we're really grateful to you. The conversation can continue in the lobby. We have refreshments, food to socialize over, and maybe there'll be some ideas that arise that we can all share. Thanks so much for coming out.